Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Paint Desk Rumblings. I'm joined tonight by uh, one of the uh, uh, absolute titans of the Night Age world, uh, world I'd say. Uh, he's the host of the Standard Radio podcast, and also, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but the uh, two-time consecutive master, the UK master, um, is Craig. How are you doing, sir? Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I wouldn't necessarily call myself a titan, but I'll take it if it, if it gets offered to me. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Uh, I'm sitting there here doing some painting, enjoying a day off. So that's nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm on half term, so I've got a full week off, and this is the first time I've reached into my hobby box. So yeah, yeah that's excellent. So uh, the topic for tonight will be tournament variants so we will be talking a little bit about tournaments that's something that's feels like ages ago that uh, in a far away time that we went to and had some fun fun at but uh, hopefully we'll get uh, get back to that soon and uh, we thought we'd just chat a little bit about what variants there are of tournaments how you can create some interesting stuff with them and uh, mix things up a bit because during the corona there's been some events on, on ub and i know some of those have been fairly creative with like uh, variations so i thought it'd be a good good thing to talk a little bit, bit about uh, do you, you have experience hosting tournaments craig i've only ever hosted one tournament i'm i much prefer playing in rather than hosting um the tournament i hosted was the uk's first ever independence lord of the rings tournament about 14 years ago so i must have posted oh. when i was about 16 or 17 <laughs> um and it was good fun i just i just much prefer playing in it um yeah yeah so i i've not hosted that many i've played in quite a few over the years <laughs> um, across a lot of different formats a lot of different game systems so yeah, yeah. all right yeah I've, I've hosted a few tournaments and played in quite a few as well so um, we'll we'll have b both both uh, angles at it here, I guess. Then that's good. But before we get into the meat of the discussion, we have some other things to address. First, it's time to shine, shine the hobby spotlight. Are you working on anything at the moment, Craig? Well, I, a few months ago, I moved into a shared house of six. And I don't really have my own hobby space at the minute. I'm um, just saving up to buy a house at the minute. And uh, so I've not done any hobby for three months. And um, the last thing I did was was sell my 3D printer before moving into the shared house, and at the minute I'm looking to to co-own one with a friend who lives around the corner. So, a hobby's been very sparse for me over the past few months. Um, I do have some ideas of like projects I want to do, um, and then when you invited me on, I thought I'd dig around and see what I had, and I found a start collecting Saurus box yeah. that I had in the cupboard. So um, from yeah. Games, Games Workshop, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I've got. I'm just going to be building, building some some lizards. Nice, that's awesome. So the the big ones or the small ones? What are you focusing on? I guess there's... I'm going to start with the small ones. I, for me, the hobby. I I'm not a huge fan of painting. Never have been. Probably never will be. But I I really enjoy building stuff. Um, I guess it's something like an adult version of Lego, and it, it's just yeah. I don't know. I've just always enjoyed um the building side of things. So. I sort of missed that when I had my 3D printer because obviously you don't you don't print things and then build them. You just literally print them and they're done. So, yeah, um, yeah, I can I can <laughs> I can relate to that. It's a, a very different thing thing to to work with the 3D printer. Yeah. Uh, um, so. so yeah, I'm just I've I've still got one eye on. I've not played my lizards for for years now. Um, probably I have played them in Ninth Age, but but a long time ago. So. I've still got one eye on maybe giving them a run out at some point um, over the next 12 months, but... Yeah, now they, not... they're getting a book soon, so that's interesting. Yeah, that's the rumor I've heard, and probably why I found the Start Collector box in my cupboard <laughs> yeah. for them, rather than anything else. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with that book. Yeah, um, for sure. I do I do quite like the current Lizard book, to be fair. I just feel like most of the options have been explored in it, and like for me, I always like trying to explore new things, so... Yeah, a new book obviously means that there's a lot of new options to explore. So yeah. I'm quite excited by that, and I'm sort of half tempted to to buy the new the new model that came out for the range um, by Games Workshop. 
Well, it's coming out tomorrow, I think, actually. Um, I think oh, yeah, that, like uh, the Lord Croak, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think he, he looks incredible. Um, yeah, I think he's, he's very similar to a certain uh, 3D printing company's slam. Yeah, that that uh, <laughs> I, I noticed that too with the the rings circling around him. Uh, yeah, so I could just. Is it Lost one, Kingdom or... that did it? Yeah, it was Lost Kingdoms. Yeah. There is a bit of me that if I do get a 3D printer, obviously it makes sense to print one. Yeah, but at the same time, building a big kit like that, and you know the quality you're going to get from Games Workshop, so yeah. um, you can always get both. Yeah. <laughs> Probably unless double <laughs> unless double uh, double frog becomes super viable. Um, yeah, you just have to make, make, mix it up. Use use uh, uh, one in every other game just to yeah, keep true. it interesting. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's cool. Uh, for myself, I'm working on a little. Um, Death Cult Hierarch, uh, a bit darker, but you might be able to see something. So the model nice. is from uh, Watchful Eye Studios. Uh, I think it's called the Young Young Kin Necromancer. Uh, some from the Kin Dynasty. Uh, they make a lot of Chinese themed uh, miniatures, really cool, and I use them for my Terracotta army. So. Um, my terracotta army is, of course, terracotta. So most things are like yes, stone, but all the living, like the, the wizards and the architects, I imagine that as living uh, people who keep the, the army going forward. Uh, mm. So those are painting as normal humans. But he has this one is a mounted variant, so he has a horse as well. You can see that one here, bronze horse, skeletal steed, sort of. Um, already painted up so yeah pretty fun um doing some fun color uh, things with the colors going deep in the pink spectrum with this one how how much terracotta have you got done almost a full army uh, i need to paint up uh an architect on chariot and two uh, um two catapults uh, and then I have everything I I I need to to feel. I think it's a five thousand point army, the, like the first army I want to feel. Then I have some more things to paint up, uh, in, in like bought in in have stored in boxes. But um, mm -hmm. it's it's getting closer, for sure. So that's nice. Yeah, you, uh, you you deal one of these armies that I always really want to write a list for, and I just I can't settle on one with them. Um, I've avoided them for a while, but like the models, especially especially after they went out of production, the amount of like unique armies you see for UD yeah. is probably more than any other army. Like obviously if you're if you're collecting I mean Lizman's a good example, then you're either gonna go Games Workshop or find something like Lock's Kingdom. Yeah. Whereas if you want to start a UD army at the minute, then you do have such free reign because the models aren't readily available. Yeah. So you sort of gotta think a bit outside the box. So it's always cool seeing UD armies because they are always yeah, difficult. like like there are uh, like three or four big companies that make like Egyptian themed undead, so you can always go with those. But then there are like so many other options with terracotta and this uh, uh the uh, Lubar who makes the uh, uh, Greek themed undead. Yeah. So hoplites, really cool stuff. Yeah. So yeah, there, there's so much um, possibilities for really unique things in the in that range for sure. But yeah, I've been enjoying painting. Painting up, up is a real speed painting project. I'm not sure how much use I will get out of a mounted uh, Death Cult Hierarch, but um, yeah, you never know. I'm not uh, n not that uh, in into what's hot at the moment in the UD. <laughs> uh, I, it is one of the <laughs> it is one of the forums I dip into whenever tournament lists are being discussed. Like, I'm not particularly interested in looking at what Infernal Dwarf lists are being discussed or what uh, what Highborn Elf lists are being discussed at any given time. But for some reason, the UD forum, if there's a if there's a few lists doing well or a big team event, it is really interesting seeing the difference in builds because I just find them slightly more interesting than other armies. Um, yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I think there's been quite a lot of experimentation in, in list building. like And actually, like people trying out ca cavalry quite a bit with them. Yeah, there's a guy, uh, I think it must have been one of the recent US team events, um, and he ran something like 2x24 Skeleton Cav. Yeah. With, 
<laughs> with a fair like I can't remember the exact build, but it's just yeah. like it's so different to what you're expect to see. And I know he played um Chris Mintz from Team America in one of the rounds and it was either nineteen or twenty to the U D and that. So there's obviously something behind that build because he's he you know he's getting big scores against good players and um it's you know, somebody had asked me six months ago, what do you think of a list with two by twenty four skeleton cabin? Yeah. I probably would have laughed, but yeah. It doesn't seem like much, but um, yeah, there, there's possibility for everything, I guess. Yeah. So that's cool. All right, shall we move on to the news? Mm-hmm. I have a few bits. Uh, let's see. Google changed the. Uh, I'm not sure how do I share the screen. That's maybe yeah. That's there we go. Entire screen. Yeah, so that you can see as well, Craig, uh, here we have a Kickstarter from Fireforge. They are doing hard plastic um, with the part dwarfs in 28mm scale. Uh, so 16 days to go and already funded uh, quite well. Uh, and like a lot of neat stuff going on here, I think. Yeah, the, do you know if that's um, true 28 mil or heroic 28 mil? I think it's um, more heroic. Uh, they, they, they've in, in the past, Fireforge has been uh, quite uh, true scale, yeah. but uh, they've been going more and more towards heroic, heroic I think. So I, I picked up some of their, um, I can't remember exactly which cavalry, a little while ago to, to use for my Centaur conversions. Yeah. But the kits are really nice. You get a lot of options on the kits. So. Yeah, yeah, they, they they do really nice plastic stuff, and like I really love the uh, like multi-part plastic kits. Games Workshop has been moving away from that lately. Yeah. Do but uh, to, to do more dynamic poses, but like the amount of customization you get from a kit like this is just incredible. And I love the way they're doing female options for for the kits. It's they they do it a lot, and it's so it, it, it's like hardly noticeable. It's it's so like mundane in a way and I really like like that. Yeah. So yeah, some cool stuff there. I'm mm-hmm. not that interested really in uh dwarven holds, but um if I were I might go for something like this. I I write a dwarf hold list probably once every two, three months and then very quickly <laughs> give up and go no, I, I don't stick very long writing them but Yeah. All right. Uh, the next piece of news is from uh, MOM Miniatures. Uh, they keep pumping out new stuff, um, and just, I just picked one miniature that I thought was really cool. This is a vampire knight with mace, so a foot knight uh, vampire character. Um, perfect for Brotherhood of the Dragon, I think. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I actually really, really like uh, vampires with maces. I think those that, that, that looks cool. So. It's an un- underused weapon in Night Page in general. Yeah, uh, I actually have my my the big vampire count model I have for my uh, von Karstein army uh, has uh, a big nice mace on him. So big fan of that stuff. All right, uh, that's all I have for miniatures. Uh, we did mention Croak as well, but uh, I think most people have seen that. Uh, but we can have some other news to talk about at least. Um, so that's Hobgoblins, the big one this week. So I guess you saw that. Yeah, I think it's a, I've seen a bit of chatter about it. I've not seen loads and loads in terms of how much when a book normally comes out, but it is quite a cool book. I just think it's a bit, I know it's not why I, I have, when I heard Hobgoblins coming out, I sort of had an idea in my head and this is very cab heavy, which I think is quite cool. Yeah. Um, I've heard people say it's quite similar to the Macar book in a lot of ways, in that it's from a race that isn't inherently cab heavy, and then suddenly you get a cab heavy supplement. So yeah, I I haven't had a chance to write any list with it, which is sort of when I sort of get an idea of what I think a book will do. But yeah, there's a few really cool units in there, um, especially in the special section, the the different types of cab you get in there. Yeah, um, like on, on the top of cavalry, one of the like unusual things about this, because as I say, it is a cab heavy book, of, uh, really, but there's no cab in core. Yeah. And that's that's unusual for 
like a cav heavy army so it, it, yeah, they, they sort of have to find a way to like either just have a big dump of, of core units that are not used to or find some way to 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 synergize with the cav in some way i, I think it's a cool book and I, i'm intrigued to see i mean we we're just talking about models i'm intrigued to see what models people come up with for it because yeah i see, i like having read a few bits on the forum um just only when I, I get bored and never click around like <laughs> some people are saying you could easily use humans to represent this book because most of the stat lines are very human-esque yeah like it, it, that... it, it, it like in the the um vassals in in the world so it can be of any race really and men yeah. a lot of them are are humans and like this book focuses on a particular species of vassals but i guess you can like use humans anyway if you want to it's still vassals so yeah and i know people that had like quite a lot of goblin cavalry from from back in seventh or eighth edition yeah because you could do some weird builds with goblins back then so they're obviously quite excited because they can drag them back <laughs> out a little bit of converting but yeah that's true i, I do think there's there's a lot of cool conversion ideas and even things like the, the two emissaries in the blotting the sun category yeah i think i'm intrigued to see what people do for those and what sort of what ideas those gave people because obviously the I think it's the Sky Mountain ones, the ones that are very similar to Lead Belchers. Yeah. Um, bombardiers. Um, I think, I, I mean, I don't think people will just use the Bombardier models for them. I think they'll come up with something a bit more hobgoblin y because, I mean, I don't really know if Ogres fit exactly into it. They're on a different size base. They're down as cavalry. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited to see what people come up with um, for, for some of the entries for sure. Yeah. Indeed, uh, like the, the the drum model also, like a big mount with big drums on it that can make some cool, really cool stuff. I think there's some good models from the uh, Lord of the, Ring, of the Rings range for that. Actually, I can't really recall what it was. You mean like the uh, like the Gundabad orcs will fit in quite nicely because they've got like some quite big orcs on Marg, but you've then also got the basic Wag yeah. Marauders. You've got things like Wag Marauders. Um, the tricky thing with Lord of the Rings is it's sort of Trying to hit the models that are in production. Um, yeah, that's true. Game, Games Workshop are actively trying to improve that by bringing more and more models back. But there is, um, yeah, they have a lot of WAG range essentially nowadays, with especially after the Hobbit movies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. There could be some cool things in there. There is a drum in there. There's things like the Goblin King who could be a big hero. Like, yeah, I think. Yeah. Not not a bad shout. Yeah, that's neat. Um, I also noticed that the. Um... A hereditary spell was quite interesting. It turns people unstable, which is a very odd spell. I've never seen anything quite like it. Yeah, I I was going to mention the hereditary spell if you didn't, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, I I think until you've written a list and sort of played around with what the hobgoblins are trying to do, it's quite hard to visualize how that spell is going to be used. Yeah, for sure. Um, like you read it and you go, oh, that's cool, but. It's a bit, it reminds me a little bit of Savage Fury, where the niche cases of Savage Fury are, you know, one in six or seven games, Savage Fury has a really big impact at one specific point in the game. Yeah, and, uh, and like, bit... normally it's used, like, as a okay buff to get yourself battle focus, but in some niche yeah. cases you can use it as a he hex to try and mess with the enemy, but it's... Yeah, exactly. So and, and in those cases... That's... Yeah, I'm intrigued to see if this spell is similar, but more often. As in, I do think I can see more uses of this already than I can of Savage Fury. Outside the fact you can use Savage Fury as a as a slight attack buff. Yeah. Um, but I I also can't visualize how I would use it in a game, and I've not looked at, you know, I've not thought about what other laws the wizards can take if the wizards are mounted because it's only 18 inch range, which yeah. for a, just... for an all mounted army, by the core. You know how's that going to interact with sort of the, the threat ranges of the army? So yeah, yeah, I'm intrigued to see how that that played off. For sure. All right, I um, also wanted to mention the fluff pieces in the book because I thought they were really good, at least compared to previous uh, supplement books, in that it's it felt very cohesive. Like uh, it's it's just a single story. It's it's a tablet found somewhere. But That, that describes uh, like the, uh, a Sean. Uh, he he made this tablet to tell, uh, ensure his overlords that they were following protocol, basically, uh, with their army that were not exceeding their limits and things like that as a, as a vassal state. And it, it felt very cohesive, whereas the 
previous books have felt like a bit of a jumble of different sources and texts and you don't really know what's going on but it, this felt really nicely done i thought yeah i've not had a chance to read it so um based off that recommendation i'll probably give it a quick read at some point this weekend yeah it's not like super uh, exciting i i'd recommend re reading the the infernal dwarf book over it for sure but uh, it, it was nice to see uh, and I, yeah i've read some bits of the infernal dwarf book yeah that's quite a nicely done book yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so moving on to uh, the was a small little fluff snippet of uh, the KOE that's coming up, um, talking about like a smith and a mount that he made armor for, uh, which was a Praton, so like a flying beast, bestial thing. So. Preton confirmed, I guess, for the Kiwi. I I hadn't heard that. Um, it's good to see that book getting some love because I think it is not at the top of the pecking order. So yeah, yeah, we could see what they do with that. I I genuinely hadn't heard that. So yeah, yeah, it's cool. I uh, I, I talked talked about about this with um, Marcos uh, on a previous previous show, but it's it's one of the trickiest book, books to get right, I think, because the community is so split. If they want more fantasy stuff or just knights, so yeah, we'll see. But this is certainly an indication that they're going a little bit bit, bit more into fantasy territory with like a mythical beast. I also think just with the KOE book in general, it's quite a hard book to get right. Um, in that, if you make cavalry slightly stronger in terms of the game, yeah, then that whole KOE book shifts how it plays. Um, yeah. So small changes to cavalry make a huge difference to that particular book more than anything else. So it's it's always been a book where you know if, if cavalry is leading the game, then the KOE book becomes very strong. And if cavalry is sort of in the middle or bottom of the pile, then the KOE book struggles to sort of stand out above anything else. So yeah. Um I, I think the current book's pretty good. I think it has options. There's one or two things missing in it, in my opinion. Um and so you sort of get railroaded into one or two particular builds, but um, I, I do like it as a book. I don't have any desire to use it myself, um, but as if they bring in new things into the book and some different options, then hopefully that might encourage some people to have a look at it. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, another book that I'm re really looking forward to see seeing what they what they do with. Um... And speaking of uh, coming books, just recently there was a announcement of a unexpected release date for the Vermin Swarm, the 10th of June. I, I'm equally nervous and excited as a long-time <laughs> Vermin Swarm player. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly things that are going to not be in the book, looking at Plague Disciples as a particular example, um, in, the, in the form they were in for sure. So... Yeah, yeah. I'm, and, and I'm they excited. were sort of important for the playstyle of Worm Swarm <laughs> before, I guess. Yeah, and, and sort of reading, so they are one army that, you know, when something is published about them, I, I definitely read because I, I own a, a lot of Worm and Swarm and I hopefully will play them in, in coming tournaments in coming years. And But just reading what's all being published on them um, and sort of their, their playstyle, their fluff, their background, I... Uh, I'm excited for the book in terms of it being a new book, but I'm also quite nervous for myself in terms of the book doesn't really. I I, I don't particularly want rats to to emulate Romans. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm isn't in, in like for me. I I fell in love with Skaven when they were Skaven. Um, so, you know, you've got these different clans, you've got these different amazing weapons, you've got these crazy characters you've got, you know, you read Go Trek and Felix book number two, whichever one was about rats and yeah. all the different clans. And you've obviously got um, some characters and like, yeah, you just got a lot going on in terms of the background fluff of, of Skaven over the years. And, and this feels a very sharp turn away from that. Um, so I'm apprehensive. I am excited. <laughs> it's a new book. And I love new books coming out and I think change is good for the game. And I agree the current Vermin Swarm book needed a bit of a, a change, so I'm, I'm excited by that. Um, and I agree Ninth Age needs to take things in its own direction. Um, but 
obviously with Vermin Tour maybe going away from a direction that I like. <laughs> yeah, another yeah that, that, that's always a risk. For for yeah. me, I've, I've, I've like just recently started collecting a, a Vermin Swarm army, mm -hmm. like in the last year or two. I haven't played anything with them yet. Um, and for me, this this new Roman aspect is really uh, exciting. Or like I, I wouldn't say that it's a new aspect actually. They they've gone down down on it harder, but but like even Skaven, if there was any real world inspiration for that army, it was Romans. It was it wasn't as obvious as Night Age are making it, but like if you look at their helmets and things like that, it is quite Romanesque. Yeah. And that, like there are aspects in the in the game as well, I think that can represent that. But from what I've seen of the spoilers, uh, I'm excited for it. Like the, uh, the the wacky machines still seem like a thing at least. So is that yeah um i and i do think with with them taking each army in a different direction i'm intrigued to whether there's armies that they take in a direction that i really like and that sort of the opposite of uh the opposite of what i've done with with vermin Tour in that you know the vermin Tour direction i'm like okay maybe it's not for me but i will i obviously will look at the book when it comes out and you know i'm like i'm happy to admit if i'm wrong when it comes out and actually i'm really excited by it but at the same time, if when they redo, for example, KOE and they change the stuff for that, that might really, really excite me. Um, so I, I, it's good the Ninth Age are taking things in their own direction and sort of picking their own yeah. path with each race. And I'm excited to see where they take each of the other races. Um, it, it just Vermin Swarm have, have been one of my long term armies, and I'm a little bit worried. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I think that's that, that's very understandable. Like if you if you've been a long fan of of the army and it it goes in a different direction, then of course it's it it might turn you off, and that's like fine, I guess. It, it's like a bit sad for you, sure, but um, maybe some other other will yeah. uh, will uh, enjoy it. Uh, I had a yeah, comment in the chat from uh, Hugo, and we have not read the Vermin book. We we're just talking from spoilers that that's been uh, seen on the forum, and we're uh, chatting about it because of the uh, imminent release of it. So we have no inside information on this. Yeah, um, and I, I was going to say something else off the back. Of, oh, I, the other thing with like armies dropping away, and I know this might be a controversial statement, and people might hate me for saying this, is with Games Workshop announcing the old world whenever they announced it eighteen months ago. Yeah, there is a bit of me that's thinking, oh, well, if I stop using Vermin Swarm in Night, then when that comes out, then maybe that'll be the project that I'm excited by because. I'll have all these models that I've not used for a couple of years. So yeah. it's, it's one of the joys of you know playing wargaming is that you can normally find more than one use for your model. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like um, I, I saw we had a video about this a long long time ago, like about it was about Age of Sigmar then and, and the Ninth Age and there is no competition was the title, which was a bit of a uh, of a um, um, of a clickbait, I guess. But like the video was about like there are two separate war games. If you like one, if you like the other, you can. It doesn't matter. You can play either. We're not yeah. necessarily drawing from each other's play bases. Yeah, exactly. So, like, play whatever you find is fun. That's. Like, yeah. all that is still true. And if you end up playing rats in Age of Sigmar and beast heads in Ninth Age and you know something else in another game system, then yeah, then that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. So yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Um, I think that's all I have for news. Do you have anything you wanna mention? No, the Vermin Swarm book was sort of the one that. You know, it obviously only just been announced, so yeah, that's sort of the one that I've been digesting overnight and yeah. rolling over in my sleep and <laughs> stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah. Uh, it is exciting, and it, I, I do think the more Nine Take moves away from sort of its Warhammer cousin, then the, you know, the more independent the game will be, the more unique the game will be, and the more scope it has to be its own game. So yeah, yeah, yeah and, I, I guess I want to like add on this, like. For me, all of the books so far have been really, really exciting. But it's, it hasn't be, been any, any army that I play. But all of the books <laughs> have made, made me interesting in getting that, that, that new army. Um, so for me, it's like, like it's been a super success every 
every book. I wonder if that will change when they finally start uh, working on an army that I collect, like uh, either Vampire Covenant, Oaks and Goblins, or uh, soon at least I'll start playing uh, Empire and Stormstyle and uh, the UD. Yeah. But uh, when that happens, I, I I don't know how how I will react. I think positively, but. Uh, a lot of uh, there's a natural lot of a lot of emotions in things like this. So yeah, yeah. And I, I think with a community-led game as well, it can be difficult in that yeah, it is built by people who who play the system, and it's all publicised in a forum. So you do get constant opinion. I don't think you'll ever like with Vermin Swarm. I don't think they could possibly write a Vermin Swarm book that every Vermin Swarm player loved. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and like people like that don't play them. So. Yeah, and and it's always like the nature of the forum that if the people who complain are seen more, yeah, so exactly. The people who are happy with it probably don't post it as as much. It's a... I do I do think it's a a good point to say that the Night Age is ultimately run by volunteers who give up their free time and yeah, it, you know, if the Vermin Swarm book isn't what I want to play. It's not because they've got a vendetta against me personally. And it's not <laughs> ruin my fun. Like, uh, yeah, I love I, that. I, I, I think sometimes when I read the forum, people forget that it is run by volunteers. Yeah, and, and it, there are no conspiracy ther- theories about nerfing some particular armies into the ground because the developers hate those armies. Yeah, I exactly. Don't, I don't buy that. <laughs> no, exactly. All right. Shall we? Uh, let's see, one more comment here. Um, uh, we're thinking about casting a game of Hogwarts versus a Vermis one next week. Is there anything you guys would be uh, willing to play? Um, I guess over UB then, something like that. I don't, uh, I, I personally I don't play online games at all. Like I, I've played a few, few in Tabletop Simulator later with Pitaglio, but that's about it. But if you're up for it, Craig, then uh, I'm sure it could be a, be a really cool thing. If, if I can squeeze it into my schedule, I, <laughs> I I very much limit myself to one tournament at a time um, over UB. I, I simply wouldn't have time for two. Um, but, I mean, the new Hobgoblins, I said, are quite an interesting book. Vermin Swarm, I mean, it'd be one last game before the book dies. Or I guess no, I think that... Like oh, he said, he said ne- next week, so that might be like uh, directly yeah. after the new new yeah. book is released. Who who was asking that? Sorry, uh, Hugo uh, Pelia. Okay. I don't, I'm not sure who yeah, that is it, on the forum. If it's the same Hugo that I'm thinking of, then it's uh, Hugo that's been creating Warhol. That could be. So he might well be suggesting Warhol. The issue of Warhol I've got, and I'm I'm sure if Hugo is listening, he'll correct me. I don't have a computer I can install programs on because it's a work computer. Um, and I know there is a browser version of Warhol, but I've not tried it yet. Um, but yeah, I, maybe Hugo. Hugo, you've got my number, so you can always drop me a text. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'm looking for, forward to it already. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the main topic, shall we? Yeah, go for it. So, tournament variants. And like, there are a lot of different ways you can mix up a tournament to create some variation. And I thought we'd go about this like going from the easier, the uh, simpler things that you can mix up, and and then move move on through to the more heavy variations and and alterations that you can do. So starting with that, like point sizes, I guess is the obvious place to start. Yeah, Ninth Age is balanced for four thousand five hundred points, but it's a f- super fun game still at other point levels. So, um, just se- selecting a different point value does create some interesting yeah. variation, in my opinion. Yeah, I, th- I mean, the game is balanced to four five hundred. Um, we back in December in the UK. I think uh, we had the Scottish Championships on UB, and that was a 5,000 point event. And I don't really think any any army stood out as breaking a certain boundary. Like, for example, maybe um, 
unseen arrows in in sylvan elves that didn't suddenly break because you added 500 points on yeah neither did neither did the monster category and beast like nothing broke because you added these 500 points on significantly more than anyone else everyone gained an advantage from it yeah and the list for 5,000, it even just that 500 point increase it created a, a new sort of nice variety some people tried different builds and different different options which is really cool to see um and it was nice just playing some different armies and, and different styles of game, even at just that jump. And it made me sort of want to try a maybe a 3,000 point event or a, a smaller point event at some point yeah. in the future. As well, because yeah, I like think... in, in Sweden, the, the 5,000 points has, has been quite common for a good while. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and like people sort of got used to it and, and like wanted to play that instead because you got more stuff into your army and that was fun but uh, i've always been more curious about doing an event with a lower point value instead um it seems uh, i i played a few 3000 points uh, games for, for a while in my life i that that was like the most common i played uh, because I, uh, I I played uh, like on on weekdays week week evenings and didn't want to spend too much time on it yeah so uh, it, it yeah, was a fun. nice point value. Although I wonder, like, if you do three thousand points in a tournament, I don't think you can squeeze in an extra game per day. No, I I agree. At three thousand, I agree. I think anything below three thousand, you're starting to look again in that extra game. Yeah. Right. Like, but it, it's it, it's not like uh, if you hold the the point value, not the game doesn't take half as much yeah. time. Yeah, and I, a... I don't know if we'll touch on it because I mean, I mean, you told me we were chatting about tournament variants, and I've got a massive list on my phone of of potential talking points, and I I very much that we'll get to them all. <laughs> um, and I don't know if we're going to talk about time limits at any point, but oh, if you can... did do a, if you did do a three thousand point event, the TO could say you have two hours, and you know that coming to the event, so you're not going to bring armies that are you know super intricate and. Uh, t- time limits and and time rounds and dice down and and slow players, is, you know, I, we could do a whole two hour discussion on on how to <laughs> yeah. on how to restrict that. And I do think lowering the points values, you could get in extra games if if people are aware of it in advance. Um, yeah, I guess my, my worry with lower points is if, for example, you take and this is a very extreme example, so I know it's not always applicable. If somebody takes a pyro master against Sylvan Elves, then in four thousand five hundred points, let's say that pyro master picks up five hundred points. Well, that's a ninth of the army across the game, which is fine. Yeah, if yeah. You drop the game down ma- to ma- magic gets proportionally stronger. Yeah, yeah exactly. A- and and overall, I think the rock, rock paper scissor scissors aspect of the game increases. So it's yeah. m- more more down to the luck of the draw, I guess. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I do think it means you have to be a lot more careful in army builds because you know that that rock, paper, scissor increases. Yeah. So if I was going to bring Sylvan Elves to a 2,500 point event, I would expect to see a Pyro Master because people would be like, oh, at 2,500, Pyro Master would be amazing. So yeah. You sort of got to think about that when you're building your list for those points values as well. And yeah, it, I agree it increases the rock, paper, scissors. So yeah, tricky one. Yeah. I, it's something I've been curious about. I, I know there was one tournament in Sweden that did uh, over a long weekend. They had a, a, a 2,500 point tournament on Friday, uh, three games, and then after that, a normal uh, two-day tournament with five games of uh, normal point size, which was pretty fun. But it, it, it I wonder if you can like draw, a, draw a crowd with 3,000 points. If, if people like, well, yes, eh, it's not worth it. Rather, just play a full game. Yeah, true. Um, I so think if maybe... you're tr- if you're looking for like a random Friday night fun event, yeah. then I think a lot of people thinking back to to sort of pre night and and to eighth edition, a lot of people sort of were up for like the hero pits where you build a hero of up to five hundred points and yeah, and like that sort of almost well beer and pretzels game. Yeah, and that ninth edition has uh, the games of Sagan, which is perfect for that. Yeah. So, but um, I wonder if like doing one day tournaments with uh, 3000 points or less uh, is more of an option. I think uh, the next sort of logical discussion point from, from a lower or a higher points value tournament is an escalation event. 
Yeah. Um, in in that that gives you the flavor of you get small points games, but then you're also building towards a big points game, so you sort of get everything across the weekend. Yeah, that's true. Um, when I've seen these in the past, like day one, the Saturday, you play um, maybe 1,500, 2,000, 3,000, and 3,500. I just made those up on the head. You can yep. extrapolate those to whatever you want. And then on the Sunday, you play two bigger games, one of, say, 4,500 and one of maybe even up to, like, say, 6,000 or something quite big. And it means that over the course of a weekend, you you know, you know, see a lot of variation, and I think variation at tournaments is good. Yep. Um, and you do get those smaller points values and those bigger points values. And I've only ever been to one or two escalation events, and they are fun. They they can be hard work, but they are fun. It it seems like quite a lot of work, both both for the TOs and the and the participants, to keep track of all of the point sizes, like in, in that way. Um, and you have to make like make good rules about it. Do, do you only add to your army, or can you like redesign your army? Can you just redesign it a little bit between different point sizes and things like that? Yeah. Um... Right. Because because a, a general that's good at at uh, or a character that's good at like uh, two thousand points might not be worth much at two and four thousand points. Um, yeah. So, and I, I do think I if somebody in the UK said they were going to put on a three thousand point event and it, over the course of the weekend it was say seven games so four on the Saturday three on the Sunday, I probably would be up for it and I, I'd be willing to try it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's not many events I wouldn't give a go. <laughs> um, I'd be intrigued to see. In a way, it's almost more accessible for new starters to the game. Yeah. Yes, the game is designed for four thousand five hundred, but also if you've got somebody that's just come into the hobby, what's the chances they're going to have four thousand five hundred points painted up? Um, yeah. Like, but, like you tell them we're going to go to an event, they've got to get four thousand five hundred all in one go. Whereas if you turn around and go. Oh, there's this little event. It's three thousand. There's yeah. quite a lot of people. There, but it's only a small game. Yeah, it's less for them to take in in terms of when they read an opponent's army list. They've got less things to think about, less to paint up. So, I think it'd yeah. be a good sign point. Yeah, um, uh, like if we if it was possible to, to like get that like a a common thing on the scene to have like smaller smaller scale events, that would be a good thing because it's a it's a good way to to bring people into into tournament gaming. Yeah, maybe you get an extra five tournament points if you bring a newbie. Yeah. <laughs> you bring someone that's never been before, you get five points. <laughs> that's uh, That could be an interesting <laughs> dynamic. <laughs> Force them right. on there for the weekend. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so point sizes. Um, an easy way to, to uh, mix mix things up. Uh, I guess we could talk about, uh, in a similar vein, uh, there are the tag team tournaments, um, where you have two people playing uh, on each si side of the board, with a small mm -hmm. army each, uh, which is also a good way to bring new people into the hobby. Yeah, I, I, doubles events uh, are wicked. Um, I haven't played one in a long time. Um, but back when I was sort of starting my tournament journey, back when I was 15, 16, 17, doubles events were easily my favorite. Like, it was a good way to get to know people. It is a bit more sociable at the table because you've got four people. Yeah. More, also, some of the lists you can write. I just met, like, I remember going to a, a grand tournament, and at the time it was Dark Elves, Norks, and Goblins. We took an all mounted Ork and Goblin and an all mounted Dark Elf, 750 <laughs> points each. And it was just awesome. Like, like the, the combination of trying to combo dark elves to orcs and goblins, and this was back in seven, so when orcs and goblins were proper random, so you'd have like your savage old ball boys trying to charge some dark, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, like, tag, tag teams are uh, have a special place in my heart. Uh, there's a it was a yearly tournament uh, mm -hmm. up until uh, the, it was the last tournament, tournament I went to actually before Corona, um, in uh, Westeros. And, and that like that is my favorite tournament every year. It's uh, incredible. Um, because as I say, it it, it has the social aspect of the game because you have more people at the table, which does add like the games take a little bit more time usually uh, because there's so much more talking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they they are super fun, and as you say, the, like list building gets really really complicated in certain ways. Um, so that's cool. And. Like you can bring newbies 
fairly easily into the game using those. There's a risk yeah. of it be becoming like played by committee. Um, so like the experienced player just takes the wheel and decides what to do, what to do. But you, you you can get around that if you're conscious of it. Yeah, and I, I think what you said is sort of the, the biggest worry I would have over a, a doubles event is you would end up with like power doubles of like two ETC players teaming together and, and just trying to, you know, steamroll people. And then at the other end yeah. of the spectrum, you might have people trying to bring people into the hobby. And then I agree what you said in the middle is that you can have teams of a newbie and a, and a not newbie. And I've, I've seen this at doubles events. I mean, it goes way back, but you basically have. <laughs> I always remember being at some of the doubles GTs and seeing. And this this isn't me being sexist. This is just me being honest. You, you're there with a guy who's brought his other half along for the weekend, and she's just sat there not playing. Yeah. And he's putting both halves of the army, and it's like that's not really doubles play at that point. It's, yeah. It's uh, that 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 can I, I I've seen seen that happen not necessarily with uh, a partner and I've seen it uh, with a guy bringing his partner along and she being super engaged in, in the game, so it yeah. can work out. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. It can work out. I, I agree. And, yeah, but uh, overall, I it, it's a fantastic game format for me, uh, and I I really really hope to see see those tournaments back back up again when we get get through this. Yeah, I, I couldn't even tell you when the last doubles event in the UK was for night. Um, I can't remember doing one under ninth age rule set, which, now that I said that out loud, is sort of a little bit sad. <laughs> yeah, you should you should experiment more uh, over there on the aisles. <laughs> <laughs> There's some good 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 fun to to be had, for sure. Um, we can also mention like team tournaments. Instead of uh, doubles, uh, where yeah. You... Um, a team events, I mean, team events are the reason I play Ninth Age, which might sound stupid at first, but without ETC and without all the friends I made at ETC, I probably wouldn't have stuck with Ninth Age after after the collapse of the old world. In that, yeah, the fact that Ninth Age was what was voted on to be played at ETC meant. That was all my mind made up. If ETC had voted to play AOS, and I'm aware that AOS is at ETC nowadays, yeah. I probably would have gone to AOS and, and just tried to make that work. So for me, team events are the pinnacle of the game. For I mean, I'm very much a gamer, as, as said in the intro. I'm building because I'm not a huge fan of painting and I don't have anywhere to paint. Like, I am very much a gamer, and team events... You know, if you are a gamer, try and get to a team event because they're just so sociable, they're so different, they're, so, like, they're just, for me, they are the reason I do the hobby. Um, yep. and yeah, that's pretty much my that's pretty <laughs> much my stance on it. Isn't it? That I, yep, if yep. you gave me a choice of going to three team events a year or three singles events, I'd pick three team events. All right. Uh, I've, I've been to a single uh, team event and I hosted one. And like it's fun for sure. You you get a whole different dynamic in the in the tournament, uh, and it's very very interesting. Uh, I, like to to those who are not aware of it, t team events are you have a team of players, um, usually uh, four uh, on smaller tournaments, but uh, eight in in big tournaments like the ETC, and if and you are drawn drawn against another team in the tournament, and then you. Uh, Use a, a certain method to determine the matchups within each between each uh, team member and another member from the other team. Yeah, and what I was going to mention when it came to team events was you've already mentioned that there's four and eight man team events, and while those two are by far and away the most popular sizes, team events do still work at three and five. Yeah, um, they do also work at six and seven, but they're not numbers I've ever seen used. Um, and both. So the odd number of events have a slightly different pairing system to the even number of events. If you've got three people, it's slightly different if you've got four people. Yeah. And even that changes how sort of your team approaches around or approaches list building or you know, approaches essentially the tournament as a whole, which is really interesting because you would think that having an extra person on the team wouldn't really make a difference. You just add a person. But um it can it can totally change how you approach stuff and how you view stuff and 
Yeah. Like, uh, one issue I've seen a bit with the team tournaments is that, uh, like, if you if it's not the ETC, uh, like a, a smaller local t- t- tournament, then uh, there's a fairly big risk of just like doubles t- t- tournaments. There, like, the ETC players team up and make a super team, and like a lot of the other teams are just there to have fun, and they they don't even try to do the matchups. They just randomize pretty much yeah. and and it, it it can be like a bit odd for the tournament especially if you're not if you don't have a like a good amount of both categories I, yeah i think in the uk we're, we're quite lucky in that we had a team event a little while ago and i think there's about 14 teams in it and after the first couple of rounds sort of the teams that are sort of have got a few new people in and sort of are there for random pairing sort of do start to get paired up also the the england etc team um Amit's the current captain, and Amit a couple of years ago decided to put in place a Lions squad, which is sort of a squad of eight to ten English players who are sort of wanting to get into the England team and wanting to take that step up from being a tournament gamer to, you know, trying to get into the England team. Yeah. It's sort of like eight to ten people that are sort of the up and coming war gamers and that they should be playing for England in the next couple of years. And that's sort of the idea behind the Lions squad. And we had a four man team event in February in England. Um, and there was, I mean, there's 18 of us in the Lions in total, uh, which eight to Team England and 10 are Lions. And we split into four groups of four, and each team had two Lions and two Team England in, which was really good. It kept the yeah. event really tight the whole way through. Um, our four teams, so the England and Lions teams, plus New Zealand, plus Wales, were all in the mix going into even the last round, I think. So, yeah, it, it can be difficult if the ETC players just form a super team. Um, it doesn't always work. We I do remember a four-man team event in the UK where four of us from Team England went together, and it was just after the ETC. It was in October, and uh, we all took some you know, some stupid lists that we wanted to try out. Yeah, yeah, that, that can also be the case. Like, like the ETC players go completely wild at this uh, these normal events and just try few freaky yeah. stuff. Um, so yeah, it it can be really good, and I for me, I think the difficulty with team events is if I lose a game in singles, I don't particularly care. Yeah. If I lose a game at the ETC or a team event where we're actually you know competing against other international teams, uh, like there is just a bit more on the line. It does just yeah. tug at the it, tug it, at the mental strains a bit more and tug at yeah. the emotions a bit more, which sure. which can be difficult. Because obviously it's just meant to be playing for fun, but um, you know, if you're playing for an international team, you obviously don't want to let other people down who have put in their time and effort into doing yeah. doing the same thing. So it can be tricky. It, it, it's uh, it, it's shared joy, but also shared, shared sorrow, which but both yeah. are, both make it more powerful, I guess. Yeah. So there's that to it, but yeah, uh, team tournaments are certainly one way to spice things up uh, and make it make something different all right um let's see i still have a few <laughs> uh things to talk about another fairly light w- way you can uh, mix it up is the map pack, map pack uh, i know some tournaments are very strict on like just using tables from the map pack um which is a supplement for the Night Age, which, which with a few a few set um, table setups of terrain. Um, how do you do it in the UK? Is it common to use the, the map pack? So obviously, with with UB over the last year, we have pretty much stuck to the map pack. Uh, the map pack did get refreshed in January, maybe I think. Yeah. Um, they they asked for submissions from the community, and the new sixty maps are. They're pretty varied and pretty different, so you know it's nice to have those mixed up. But um, obviously, if you're at a real life event, it can be hard if you don't have the 2D terrain to do a map pack. Yeah. Um, and you just go sort of make do with whatever the venue has. So it, it sort of depends on if the terrain is available and and you know what is at hand. Um, if we've got the terrain available, then we probably would debate using a map pack. Um, if not, then it's just sort of make the table look competitive. Um, the the Scottish Championships, the one that was five k, was it that one? It was either that. I think it was that one and one before it that um, that Luke ran. 
Um, they both use their own map packs, and the maps were quite different, and a couple of them had special rules for certain terrain pieces. Yeah, there was like an, a Loch Ness, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a Scottish champion, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, th I feel like Luke, who ran November before that, also did um, his own map packs, which, which is cool to see, and obviously the TOs get to build those. I think with custom map packs, you can get some quite, going back to the whole um, rock, paper, scissors, you can get some quite rock, paper, scissors, maps like for example the Loch Ness one obviously if you had a lot of infantry then that's not good whereas if you had no. a different build then it doesn't really impact you and and if you had a, had a, a lot of Krakens you had a field day yeah exactly like, and there's <laughs> just uh, things like that where one of the maps was all of one side of the board was wooded um whereas the other side of the board wasn't pretty much yeah. and you know that that tilted some matchups towards shooting heavy builds that got the correct side of the map so yeah. Yeah, there were some interesting things, and I do think the current map pack, um, so we're using it in the current event, and we're on map B4, and B4 is a little bit of an odd map, and there are a few in that map pack from, from the ninth age that are that do mix it up, and I'm, I'm looking forward to playing on it. It's a different map. Um, it would be hard work, I think, but um, yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to play on. In Sweden, it's been, like, some tournaments you use them, uh, it's decently common, I think, uh, but a lot of tournaments just put up whatever train they have and like try and make something fun, uh, more or less. And and it's very rare in those cases that you like release a map pack beforehand so that people can see it and prepare. Like you just show up to the event and see what the tables are like, more or less. Yeah. But I know that was one tournament that specifically made it a like a a a, a thing in in building the the maps that he wanted one side to have a clear advantage in that they wanted to try and make the choice of shoes of choosing side to be better because it yeah. obviously means you don't have the option to go to be sure that you go first in the game uh, so it gave more power to the people person sho choosing sides in the, in the in the game which i think was interesting and i think that's been sort of the sentiment in the new map pack as pap, map pack as well that um, there should be more difference to the sides yeah, um, certainly got that feeling from playing them. The, only, the last round, so it would be map B3, because we're literally just doing B1 to B5. B3 was uh, was basically mirrored, which was really odd because the rest oh. of the maps, like there is a, <laughs> there does seem to be an advantage to most of the maps. Yeah. And then there's just this one random map that is basically yeah. the same for both players. And I, yeah, it was just quite interesting, but. Um, yeah, as, as a TO, I, I remember, remember like when you put out a train, we, we sort of let, like we have two hills and two forests and a lake and an impasse in, for, for each table and like maybe something else. And it's so easy that it gets super symmetrical. You have to like force yourself to make something different. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, agree. So that's a bit interesting. All right, so. Um, I think we can go into like some um, deeper things you ma you mentioned, like special train, um, like unique rules for train pieces. Yeah, or even just unique rules for. So obviously, in the ninth age, you've got six deployments and you've got this map pack, but there are more than six ways of deploying armies. Yeah, um, <laughs> and it's the same with with maps. Like, yes, we've got this terrain that's in the rule book, but also you. You can just because it's a fantasy game. You can say that you know that that lake is a a toxic lake, and that yeah, you know, you know, something happens if you roll a certain. But like, I and I do think there is more variation to be had than what we currently use in the maps. But that is obviously up to player or to your discretion. Um, I know the Ninth Age had. I assume it still does. I've not looked recently. Had a supplement of sort of bonus scenarios. Yeah, I, I work, worked a bit on that. But they also have a supplement of uh, bonus terrain, I think. But it, it yeah, that was, got... that was my next question. Was, I don't yeah. know if they've got <laughs> them for bonus terrain. Yeah, and, I, and... I think they, they, they missed, misplaced the focus a bit on, the, on that one. I think they made like one faction unique terrain for every every faction. And I, I'm not sure how useful that is in the game. Like, how do you set up a t tournament using that? It feels a bit weird, I think. But like just having like this lake is, to is toxic. Here's a volcano that shoots out magma and damages things and stuff like that can certainly make makes things up. Yeah, and 
because both players know about that terrain going in, like is another way of influencing if the board side choice is more important. So if, for example, on the bottom left of the board, there is a volcano that damages the nearest unit D6 strength 4, well, when you pick board sides, if you pick the bottom, you know you're going to be near the volcano. So yeah. you're probably not going to deploy your pathfinders next to it. So you you can sort of make these little adjustments that do little things and you know, even if that's an extra channel or small amount of damage to the D6 strength 4 or you know, just these little changes can, can make some quite interesting effects and also mix up quite a lot and I guess change people's opinions of where they want to be, which yeah. I don't think is a bad thing. How, um, like in, in the uh, Scottish Masters tournament, I believe it was that everybody played at the Loch Ness table in game four or five or whatever. And then everybody had the same rules. And I like that's very easy on, the, on a UB event too. But if you're doing a real life event, like having a big lake for every table is not a, that easy. So, like, no. is, is, is how big an issue do you think it is to have like each table being like very unique? And I don't think it's an issue, especially if the tournament organizer is using Tourney Keeper and the the option where people don't play on the same table. Yeah, because then, um, like, if, for example, there's a a forest that gives you an extra channel. And you've got someone that's gone super magic heavy and they're just getting these free channels, then you know, they should probably shouldn't play on that five games in a row. <laughs> yeah. We'll give them a slight advantage. And so I do think having these individual tables that each have a slightly different effect, especially if it's a themed event, so something like around Halloween or around, you know, Christmas, and you've got all these, you know, I do you do you did used to. I obviously haven't recently with with COVID and just less events you do have these themed events around different holidays yeah and so having effects based on those holidays i don't think it's a bad thing because people then you know people know this before they go and so they go to this event and they're like yeah. oh yeah it's a christmas event my opponent's obviously going to get a free present on turn four yeah um i, I i'm uh, asking because th this is something that's fairly common in, in sweden to have like, have tables like that uh, and i myself host tournaments with very unique tables so. Um, and people seem to enjoy it, but there is some like grumbling about uh, having a. It's it's an additional thing to the luck of the draw, I guess. Like if you I get don't a, think if I don't you get a really bad terrain is horrific in the game. Even late yeah. nowadays are just dangerous terrain one for infantry, and I'm yeah. I'm not convinced that's awful all the time. And it like as yeah, long but... as the CEO says in their pack, you know the tables yeah. are going to be themed, yeah. or the tables are going to be different, or. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, like it, it should be something that's known, of course, going in. Like, yeah, exactly. And if if it's not your cup of tea, then you don't sign up. Sign up, of course. Like, but uh, they they can be like it, it does affect the balance, I guess. Um, and 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 so and maybe makes the the whole whole tournament more ran random in who it's not not purely down to skill, perhaps who wins. But I guess adjusting to conditions is part of the part of the game. So yeah, um, right. And the, the, I mean, we might come on to something that's related to this in a minute. But I I think variation isn't a bad way of finding out who better players are. Like if you always played on map A one, and you always played with the same list, then yes, you get very good on that map with that <laughs> yeah. list. But, you know, as a as somebody who likes to do well at events, if I show up to an event and there's a really tricky table to play on, then fine, I will try and find a way to make that map work for me. And there was an event. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's that's part of the challenge and part of the fun, I guess, too. Yeah, there's an event, and this is going back about maybe three or four years. There was an event at, uh, in Birmingham that Jordan was running. And uh, table one had about three or four pieces of impassable on. Ooh. And I was using Wild Heart Ogres, so quite MSU, single models. And so for me, like that table did suit my army. And I was but I was also like, we can move the terrain if you want, guys. Like I'm not Yes, the terrain suits my army, but also if you think it gives me an unfair advantage, then move it. If you if you're desperate to move it, go for it. So I think before the last game against uh, Adam Jones, it did all get moved around because people were suggesting I had too much of an advantage, but then like the terrain is what it is. Like if people want to move it, like it, 
if somebody is really unhappy with terrain, I've never known it in an event where somebody's really unhappy with the terrain and doesn't say anything. Because people will come to the TO and be like, oh, can I just check the terrain's right? Yeah. Especially when people put like their cases or their army yeah. cases on the table. That, that, that's like, all, all, terrain does good move, so... Always interesting, like, all the terrain gets shuffled into a corner and someone shows up like, yeah, exactly, is yeah, it yeah. meant to be like that? <laughs> and I know or, some, or... although some people are, are like a bit timid perhaps and and they don't ask about it <laughs> they just go with it and it <laughs> becomes a bit odd but uh, the middle of the board is just a line of impasse yeah. <laughs> exactly um all right um like tying in, in, into this i guess we can talk, talk about like more special scenarios because I if you're doing unique unique tables in terms of of terrain you can also do unique scenarios for those tables something that uh, i do very often um, yeah, I I think as long as again as long as people are aware in advance, like part of building a list for a tournament, but well, depending on the type of tournament, part of building a list for a for a whole tournament is it needs to be good at a variety of missions. And I think the current six missions encourage certain builds. Um, and then this the current UK event it had a different mission last round in round three, which was really nice. It was really nice thinking about something different and trying to do something new. Do you um, recall what it, what it was? Yeah, so the, the only caveat to this is that the current UK event is very different and there's a new list each round because there's a veto system, um, which we, I guess we might discuss later. But the mission was um, on your opponent's list, you mark their most expensive unit, their least expensive unit, you pick one of their characters and you pick one of their non-character units that hasn't already been picked. So you've got one character and three units. Whoever kills the most of those units wins. All right. Um, and because you were writing your list each round, like it was feasibly possible for that round to write a list with no scoring. <laughs> because nothing needed to be scoring for that, which was quite interesting, like seeing some yeah. of the builds that came out. Um, so like me versus James, who's the New Zealand captain. Between us, we had three scoring on the board, um, which was quite fun. It was, it was a different game. It was. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's cool. All right. Um, I that that sort of reminded me of uh, something that we perhaps skipped, and maybe you were going to mention as well, like sideboards. Yeah. Um. So yeah, detachments. We we've had a couple in the UK uh, where you write three thousand five hundred points that stay the same, and then you have two detachments of a thousand points, and you pick from them before each game. Um. The only issue with that was that. The person who chose sides also picked detachment first, which I disagreed with because some detachments were very, very. Yeah, I, th I think that should be a hidden choice, rather. I I agree. I that I you... think both players should have just messaged uh, the TO uh, a letter. Um, yeah. Or, or you know, in person, you write it down on their paper and, and yeah, over. like reveal it at the but, same time. Yeah, so that was the one surprise really in that. But in terms of the event, it worked quite well. A lot of people just use the same detachment every game, so yeah. some people use it really cleverly. And like uh, it was, it was also using the Masters side event that was going on at the same time as the Masters. And I think Josh Burns won that event. I'm pretty confident he did with his Sylvan Elves. And one detachment was like two by ten Pathfinders, and the other detachment was two by five Thicket Beasts. Um, so that, just, that's a really, big difference. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And like that massively changes what the opponent wants to pick in theirs. So yeah. I think it was quite a clever detachment choice from Josh. And I, I think looking back, we've had two detachment events, including that master side event. And you, you see like maybe 20% of people use the detachments really well and quite cleverly. Yeah, And then everyone else either just has an obvious detachment they're going to take or even just submits one list. So it's a good event. I, I'm not convinced it is used. It has that much impact compared to what people think it will. Yeah, I th um, one of the downsides of it, like we talked about, the, the availability for for new players, and like even though it doesn't require you to have a bigger army, it it sort of uh, incentivizes it, and and you get a downside if you don't have access to like an extra one or thousand points or so to to form the, form the sideboard. So it's yeah, it, it's that... a bit. Oh, I, I used there. to play a lot of Malifaux, um, like a lot of Malifaux, and the the old format for Malifaux was you found out who you were playing, you found out the strategy and the schemes for that game, so the scenarios, and then you wrote your list. 
yep. from your whole faction. And the issue I always had with that is it massively incentive well, a, a very similar but quite extreme example. Like Malifaux is about 50 soul stones per game. There was one GT I showed up to with uh, Marcus from the Arcanist, Arcanist faction, and he could use anything in that faction plus any beast plus any mercenary. <laughs> And I showed up with every model he could possibly pick. About <laughs> 200 models. I only used about 10 for the whole weekend. Like I didn't really vary my list very much. Yeah. I was like, like in certain scenarios and against certain things. Yeah, like I have a massive advantage just because I've spent more yeah. money. Which I I must. That was the one issue I really had in Malifaux at the time. Was if you spend more money, you win. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, that, and that, war that's... gaming shouldn't be a pay to win game. It should be a yeah. A collectible game that you then use, like, and so, yeah, yeah. it's it's not, it, it, it it's not necessary to add that aspect to the game game. Uh, and even though like it's fun to have cyborgs, it it does go into that a little bit um, with like if you have a bigger collection, you have more to choose from, and you can use it more effectively. I, I remember I, I played one one such tournament, uh, or at least, uh, and like the last one I I went to at least then. Um, the only thing I varied in my list was the equipment on my general, um, and like that was nice, but it, it, it didn't do that that much. Um, I I think the I think this is why the cyborg event and our current veto event in the UK work really well on UB because everyone has access yes, to everything. Yes, that's very true. Um, and so I think it's a really powerful use of UB, and it was part of my frustration on the early UB events in the UK, early in lockdown, was we were still just doing 4,500 single yeah. lists. And I was like, why? Yeah. Like, why <laughs> are we not doing anything else? Um, that, that, that's very, very true. Like, U, UB, it's a different format, and, like, you should use the medium to your advantage, I guess. Like, do something that you can't do normally um, if you're going to do UB events. Seems like a good, good idea. I think while while we've got UB and like I know I know UB is not for everyone and that um and I, when I say UB that does extend to Warhol and you know yeah. to an extent tabletop simulator as well v virtual gaming or something. yeah I, I generally speaking just use UB as a catch-all because yeah. I'm so used to saying it nowadays yeah um, <laughs> while UB is a system and it, you know while lockdown's not fully over even once it's over I do think UB will continue to be used quite widely like why not have these events where you write a different list every round or have a massive sideboard or have like six thousand points it, you know everything is accessible to everyone yeah and for me like i've not used so since scottish championships where i use silver elves i've used five different armies i've not used the same one at two events and even before that i used Infernal Dawson Morris. I think I'm on like seven armies in my last eight events. Just because it's on UB. I'm like, well, I don't want to use the same army twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's quite nice for a lot of people is UB does let you just try things out. Which... Yeah. And the way I understand it, like at the start of the pandemic, people were like just using their normal list. But towards like the end, or like nowadays at least, it's not quite over yet. Uh, then people were experimenting a lot more, like bringing all kinds of stuff. So it's a mentality thing, I guess. Yeah. You have to get used to it. All right, let's go back to like some table specific scenarios. So I mentioned that I, this is something that I've done quite a lot in my tournaments. Like I, I we sort of decided to, to make terrain that was very unique for each table and, and then make a scenario that fits the terrain pretty much. Or at least in some cases, and we've, we've had some success with that. People seem to appreciate it. Um, some people think it's maybe a bit unbalanced. Um, but as we said, as we've said, like if you if you feel that way, then there are other other tournaments, I guess. Yeah, and I think I I think it's a really cool idea for an event. I guess my only apprehension with it is if you take the current six scenarios as an example. And let's say the missions are vaguely based off those six scenarios. Yeah. Just so we've got something to talk about. Yeah. If yeah, and, and, playing... and a, a, lot, a lot of them are like there are the ones that you where you pick up uh, spoils of war inspired, where you pick up a few tokens, maybe 
there are an, a different number of tokens that you pick up and may, in some of the games the uh, token gives certain special rules while you carry them um, mm -hmm. and things like that so yeah there are diff th oftentimes they are inspired by the six uh, common but scenarios i think if you then take quite a varied list of an event and end up playing say hold the ground six games in a row yeah or, or a variant of then you're like oh um I regret bringing this list. And that's just because of the tables you've played on, which yeah. can happen with terrain, but to a lesser extent, because I think any army can play around any terrain. I don't think, like, bar huge amounts of impassable terrain, bang in the middle yeah. of the border, every terrain is playable around. So yeah, it's it's a bit bigger shift, I guess, with the the, the scenarios, and and it's, it makes it even more um, like matchup and, and and luck of the draw dependent. Yeah, because you can kind of end up with playing pretty much the same scenario over and over again. Yeah. Um, another type of more unique scenarios that I've tried a little bit in my tournaments is uh, cards, where you have like a deck of cards or a hand of cards that you pick for before each game, which uh, determines the scenario that you are going for at least. Uh, and there's lots of different ways to do to do this um the last one i did and when i really liked that one was you got a deck of, of three cards at the start of the tournament and you choose one for each uh, each game and then after the game you switch with your opponent so you, you get you always have a three on your on your hand and you if your opponent uses one against you you, you get to to access that in, in the next turn um the one way i and this goes back to Malifaux is but I loved the way you picked scenarios for Malifaux and I saw wish that there was something similar in Ninth. I think I don't think it would ever happen in the UK. I think there would be too much sort of pushback on it. But for, for anyone that's not ever touched Malifaux, the way that the scoring worked in game, and I do think you would still have victory points, which in Malifaux you didn't, was that both players were playing a certain mission for four victory points. So for maybe four tournament points or three. So you're both playing the same mission, you know you're playing that mission. So let's say that's hold the ground. There's then also five secondary missions, which could be like kill the enemy general. Uh, and break, and like these were like randomized before the battle, the second secondaries. Yeah, exactly. So there's five random secondaries that are, it's the same pool of five for both players. Both players then secretly pick two of those five, and they're both worth a certain amount of victory points each. So in Malifaux, you're playing for eight victory points, four is the mission that you're both playing on, and then you can each score up to two on your individual missions. And, those and so during the course uh, of the game... And those don't affect like the opponents. If you get your, your mission, it doesn't affect your opponent's score, only your score. Correct. But there, there was sometimes where, for example, you might have a protect the leader mission and an assassinate mission, yeah, all right. So if I choose to protect my yeah. general and you choose to assassinate my general, that's a big swing. Yeah. It just meant that during the game, you knew you were both playing for a certain mission, fine, but then you also knew that your opponent had picked two of those five, and so you were trying to stop them almost doing six things, which was good fun, like, and it is quite a lot of cognitive work. But also, like, if I show up to a game against Vampire Counts and it's hold the centre, then... I'm probably not going to win that mission, but I can still play for my secondary mission and get some more points yeah, that way. Yeah, and you can like figure out how the the uh, Vampire Covenant player is going to play based on the mission on, on the big mission, and choose your secondary missions based on that. Like you might not think you're going to be able to get her general in that sort of scenario. Yeah, exactly. So you, you might pick missions based on movements. So like going yeah. back to Malfo, there was one mission where you had to touch all four sides of the board with one model. Yes. Which was hard work. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> against vampire counts, that's you know, that's not... yeah. If, if especially if it's hold hold the ground and the area is going to camp the center, yeah. then yeah, you, you just know. run around the yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're free so, range. <laughs> um, so I I, I, don't, I would like to see something like that. I, I that, think uh, that is sort of what I did in the last tournament I, uh, with the cards because there was a. Uh, I think we did like maybe a bit too much. I think we had the unique scenarios for every table, but a lot of the t t tables were just so some variation of the standard scenario. Um, but it was table specific uh, secondary objective. But then you also had like a secret objective, which was the card. Uh, so you get get to pick one of those before each battle. And I think it was like some of them were secret the whole game. Others were revealed halfway through, and, and yeah. some variation yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. 
Yeah, same, same but, but, but the same thing that if you, uh, I, I think we made it, uh, yeah, it was usual uh, 20, 20 zero system with the uh, standard scenario and all that, but then you could get three extra points. So you could get, get uh, 23 points for total for the battle. And then the opponent could get three points if you got uh, 23. I think going above the 20 nil system has some interesting options as well. Um, yeah. I I can't remember the last tournament in the UK that was nothing other than 20 nil. Um, it's not, not common. <laughs> I'm not a huge advocate of win loss draw, so I'm not going to mention that too much. Um, but I do think having a system where it is a 20 nil game, but you can also get this, is especially if it's a mission that it can maybe only be achieved by the losing. Well, maybe that's a bad idea. I'm, I don't know. I'm not really feel about it. But I think. Something outside of twenty nil can be a really nice system because it gives people something yeah. else to play for outside yeah. of. I, I wonder though, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like in in this could have been an issue in, in Malifaux, I guess. But something that I was worried about with having these uh, uh, cards and that you could, could score above the twenty twenty zero li limit was that like if you just co cooperated with your opponent, like if you I, I, if I get my secret, you get your secret. Like they both work towards that goal, then you bet you're both benefited. So, in, in Malifaux, it was still win loss draw, um, and victory points were the differential, so similar to how victory points scored might be the differential at current ninth age events. So, you, you wanted to score as many as possible and stop your opponent because that was the tiebreaker on a win loss draw system. Right. And obviously, on win loss draw, you're much more likely to, um, to need that tiebreaker. I yeah. think. The way of stopping that in ninth would be when you get to the end of the game, and let's say the missions are worth three points, you score three points if you got your mission and your opponent didn't get theirs. You score yeah. two points if you got your mission and your opponent got theirs. Yeah, but then it becomes a problem of like if they are secret, then you can't really play to stop your opponent. So then they have to be open. Um, so that changes the dynamic a bit. But um, hey. so something to keep in mind at least. Yeah. Um... Yes, it's a fair point. I think I don't. Know. I don't really know the way to solve that. In the, in the if you've got these decks of secret missions, you know if everyone has the same deck of say ten, then you know you're trying to stop ten missions, which is hard work. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's the, like the, 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 that's the other other variant as as you know the card mission is that you each player gets a deck of like five five six seven cards, and then they have to choose one for each game, and and then that's spent, uh, and they everybody gets the same deck. But um, you have sort of an idea what what options are there are. Th that's fun too, for sure. Yeah, and it's I guess easier to balance. All right. Um, anything more on um, cards or like scenar scenarios like that? I, I would recommend that I really enjoyed my last round against James because of the list, because of the mission. There was a lot. Like it was just nice playing something outside the six. Those like the map packs being refreshed. Those six missions have pretty much stayed the same. Yeah, as long as I can remember, really. And so everyone has their favorites and their least favorites, and um, you know they're balanced in a certain way towards a certain way too much plastic glue that needs to go somewhere for a bit. <laughs> um, they're balanced in a certain way for a certain thing, and you know they do they do a job, but you know missions certainly are limited to those and. Secondary missions are cool. There's a lot of games that use secondary missions. It's not just, you know, it's not just Malifaux. That's just the one I have the most experience in. Lord of the Rings does it. Um, I, I think 40k still does it at the minute. It definitely yeah. used to the last time I played it. So most games use secondary missions, and Ninth Age has the primary missions, which, well, you could say actually killing is the primary mission, then you've got yeah. the secondary missions. <laughs> I think like, that's the way is, it's phrased. There, there is a mission supplement, which... Um, is quite cool and has some good ideas in. But also, I, I do think there's a lot of scope in Ninth. Like, I, Ninth Age is, is a good enough game system that you can try things with missions, you can try things with secondaries, you can try things um, a bit out of the box. And, and like, essentially, when it comes to tournaments, people will vote with their feet. If, like, I think Shane, who's running the current veto event in the UK, was a little bit worried that. People wouldn't be up for it because it is quite complex on the face of it, but it's proved to be really popular. And 
Yeah. I do think people are happy to try stuff that's a bit different um, because the majority of people are in the game just to have some games and have some fun. Like, Yeah, for sure. There's, there's very limited people who aren't in it for that. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. I think one more like category of, of variation uh, we can talk about is uh, something I uh, mentioned or wrote down as a bullet point, armor list trickery. So, like changing the rules to how you make your arm list. Uh, I know yeah. so, there was one tournament that they did, like, in addition to your army, you get a giant from the, the giant supplement. Um, like, that's one of the way, ways. Yeah, uh, I, I, I guess we can, like, start by talking about allowing supplements or not allowing supplements. What's your take on that? I, I, I had a discussion with someone on Twitter the other day to the point where he messaged me and asked my forum handle so we could carry on the discussion <laughs> over more than 280 characters. <laughs> um, I, I'm a huge fan of the four supplement books and I think I'm okay with the giant book. There's a couple of the giants which I do think need tweaking but I also don't think giants are super overpowered enough to re-worry about. Um, I I think allowing them is the correct choice. I, I think yeah. variation is a positive thing for the game. Um, and the point I made to the to the chap on Twitter, and apologies for forgetting, forgetting your name, so I probably will just link you to this video rather than type out my thoughts now. Um, <laughs> I, I think variation is a positive thing for the game. I, I asked him on Twitter, I said, would you rather go to an event and play five armies you've already played 500 times, or would you rather go to an event and play five brand new armies? And he said he would rather play the armies that he's played 500 times. And for me, I personally don't get that. I think variation in the game is a hugely positive thing. Yeah. Um, when I when I wrote a, the, the full Centaur list that I took to ECC a few years ago, it confused and surprised a lot of people. It made a big difference in the pairings. And, you know, it was different enough from the, the then Beasthood builds to sort of be, con, you know, construed as a completely different army. And I, I think a lot of people enjoyed trying it out after the event and, and messing around with it. And I enjoyed playing it. And I I understand why people bring the same list to a lot of events over and over and over. But I also, I, I just couldn't do it. It's, what, well, I mean, it's quite obvious. Like, yeah, I've used eight uh, nine books. Uh, sorry, I've used eight books in my last nine events. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it, I, I, it, it comes down to play, player type like what your preference jimmy tony jimmy timmy spike johnny timmy spike um yeah like it, it, some people prefer to uh, i guess it's the spike approach of uh, nuts and bolts wanting to know everything about the game those can suffer from having supplements allowed i guess uh, because it's a lot more uh, things to keep track of like um but personally i i, I, I hugely in favor of allowing them if you bring a supplement book or even if you bring a build that is so different from the norm like for example my centaurs i expect to have a two or three minute monologue at the start of my game where i'm telling my opponent what they do if yeah. they want to yeah i'm not gonna rock up with an ask and i've used ask in the past i'm not gonna rock up with ask my opponent's gonna go oh can you just run me through your list and i'm gonna go no <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that, Ir irrespective of whether it's a supplement <laughs> book or a core book. Yeah. If I show up with my Ogre Kingdom Wildheart build, and people are like, "Oh, can you just talk me through what hunters do?" Yeah. I'm gonna tell them. If I show up with Asklander yeah. and someone's like, "I've never played Asklander before," I'm gonna tell them every rule and every interaction yeah. that my army is gonna do, because I'd rather they had fun, I had fun, and if I'm aiming to win the event or win the game. I want to beat them on merit rather than because they didn't know a specific rule. And that was my issue of Hordes and War Machines when I used to play that was you could lose a game by not knowing a single rule or interaction from yeah. 25 inches away. And I, I just think if you're not if you're not happy with the supplement books, it's because you're assuming that people aren't going to talk to you. And I think that's quite <laughs> rough. <laughs> yeah, could be. I, I think like at the moment I, I, I definitely don't have a problem at all with them. I, I want to see them allowed on every every event event. But I wonder like if down the line when like every army has two supplement armies, then maybe it's it's too too much. Um, but uh, I guess we'll see. Do you, do you ever think there will be a point in Ninth Age at which there are thirty two supplement books? 
I mean, if they just keep on doing what they're doing, I, I know that's the goal, but uh, like, it, it's it's <laughs> probably not going to happen, not for a long time at least. Because I, I, I had an idea a while ago, and this, this might be an awful idea, and I had an idea a while ago, which is that you essentially have a book rotation in Ninth Age. So for the year 2021, you might have the 16 current books. And then for the, the back six months, so starting July the 1st, if you want to go to a official tournament in any capacity, then let's say Warriors, Demons, and Infernal Dwarfs drop out and Cultists, Aslanders, and Hobgoblins come in. And so you have this rotation every six months of... It, very similar to if anyone's ever played Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone or anything like that, you have seasons where books come in and out. Um, that can be really interesting. I <laughs> I, I appreciate it when the events like if somebody if some if a new player only had warriors and they're like oh I'd be mean, like oh no bring them anyway but at, like an official event yeah or like to be ranked or something. that 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 could like I, I think like the approach would be like to for ninth age to like maybe tie to to the background to to the story what's going on and like in this season these factions are not that present so if you want to play by our our fluff rules then don't use these factions like simply state that and then some tournaments will all right we'll, we'll go that we'll go with that and others will choose not to i think you could just do that with a supplement book so like for example yeah 20, 2021 you're allowed to use hobgoblins cultists and macar yeah on the second half oh the the, the macar went off to do something in the fluff and therefore, the Asklander showed up. Yeah, and, and th that would be a lot more friendly to to players, I guess, because then if you have an an, an Asklander army, but this season you can't use them, then just play them as Warriors of the Dark Hearts instead. Yeah, and it means there's only ever three active supplements. Like all the supplements are there, and you can use them in friendly games. But there's only three yeah. active supplements for tournaments, and you know TOs could do that. But if it's TOs doing it by themselves, then they might get some backlash if people really want to use Makar and they've said, oh, well, there's no Makar at this event. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, that could be cool. For sure. And it's, it's a way to get, keep it keep it in check, I guess. All right. Um, so back to um, the other uh, list trickery. So like uh, giving everybody a free giant, so that sort of thing. Um, I've been thinking about one way of doing this um, quite a lot. Uh, I, I, I want to do at a tournament, and it sort of ties into, like, I know for me and a lot of people, they want the game to be more focused like, around big blocks that you push around, not the single models. Um, it's a contentious topic, but uh, some people 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 prefer that too. And anyone, anyone who knows me knows where I fall on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've uh, listened to to your podcast, and I think you're 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 more of the uh, lots of uh, single models running around. Lateral movement is that a term you you, you use? Yeah, lateral movement. That's it. Yeah. So, but uh, one thing I thought I had to, to like encourage this is to in the uh, rules pack create rules for a, a general's retinue. So. The idea is that in addition to your normal army list, you get a free core unit um, that the general has to has to to be able to join and has to join, and they they get a bodyguard for the general, uh, and he can't leave that unit, so something like that. So you get a few downsides with having to put put your general in this unit, but you get an extra free unit. Free unit that's a big block. Yeah, I, I think little things like that could be quite interesting. I think, and it's like, and it's not not a, a forced. If you want to play your, your general on a on a big dragon or on a horse uh, shooting out uh, like a missile out of units or whatever, uh, then you can do that. You, but then you don't get a free unit. So, I I think as with any rules pack, um, certain list restrictions benefit more than others, and you know. As, as we go through some of the other list restrictions that might come up, I can give some more tangible examples. Like the current UK event certainly benefits certain armies above others. Um, yeah, I, I call that one. I'm trying to think of which army might benefit the most from a, a bodyguard unit in core. But... <laughs> I, I think demons might be a contender. 
Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I've been thinking about may maybe putting in some some like specific limits so that uh, maybe forbid li lemurs from being the the retinue, or, or and maybe also the uh, uh, electoral knights because it, it doesn't feel right that the empire should have like a big bodyguard cavalry unit like that. But maybe it's not a big issue. I'm gonna put three raiding chariots in my beast herds. <laughs> that would be cool. Shamanism chariot. <laughs> oh yeah, like that 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 build. Uh, it, it was I, I I heard about it. It it was quite spectacular. Um, was it Kev that ran it? Pardon? Was it Kev uh, Stonebanks that ran the chariot? Yeah, the Kevin chariot? Jeff. Kevin Jeff were both running it. Um, yeah. And then I've since run it at an event, and I've seen it plenty of other times at events, and. Uh, it is a very strong build. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, you had some other uh, list restric restrictions in mind. Yeah. So I mean, the, the one that's sort of forefront of my head at the minute is the the current UK. I have no idea where that bit went. Oh, find that later. Uh, the current um, UK event that's going on is a veto event. So before every round, you get paired up with a player. So at the minute, I got paired up with Jake Cortine, who's Kremlin on the forum. Um, and his list blog is is really good for sort of delving a bit more into the the background behind this event. If you want to know a bit more about sort of his choices on on certain things, uh, but you basically ban one magic law, one special item, one core unit, one special unit, and one unit from one of the special sections in the book. So, for example, in um, I'm currently using Beast Herds, so that uh, sorry, I'm using Ogre Kingdom. I'm not using Beast Herds, uh, so that is either Chained Beast or um, the shooty bit. I can't remember what it's called. Black Powder, I think. Yeah. So, uh, Jake banned from me. He banned uh, Tormatology. He banned Bruisers. He banned Saber Tusks. He banned um. Gratapults, and he bans Liger's Tongue. So why, I then why have I not he heard about this tournament before? This sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um, <laughs> Shane had the guts to run it after hearing about it on on a little podcast called Slum Rat. Um, <laughs> and it was it was the format I wanted the UK Masters to be because I think it makes you really think outside the box. You can't just bring netlists. It's on UB, so you can be really flexible with list building, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, D Jake's banned those. I banned from Jake. Um, I banned Alchemy, Kidim Titans, the banner of AP Zero on stumps and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, Infernal Warriors, and Artillery. And so we both go away. We both write our list. We got paired up on Wednesday, so we had two days to do our vetoes. Lists are due in this evening, so we'll both submit our lists. And then we'll play our game. And like you know the mission before each round. You know the map. You know the deployment. And it, it's been super different. It's been really interesting. As I said, me, me and James last round, um, we ended up with three scoring between us because the mission <laughs> you didn't need scoring for. So that was, yeah. that was good fun. Um, and it's been, it's been a really... Like some of the builds you see for some specific matchups are absolutely crazy. Like um, Mike Newman, he's, he's a good friend of mine. He He's running vampires as always. And for one of the rounds, he took like six vampire, the smaller ones, um, the despawn? No, the, the, the actual the, 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 the courtier. Yeah, he took like six of those <laughs> and a count in a unit of ghouls. He was like, it was against warriors, and he was like, well, if the guy takes Beldrax, then I've got nothing that can kill them. And so me, me, him, and Adam Jones have been writing lists together. And we're like, well, what if he charges into the front of seven vampires? Does he not just die? And he's like, oh yeah, they do just die. So you, you've got these super different lists, but. You can also veto the things that your army is inherently bad against. So yeah, um, yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool format, but obviously quite an extreme list altering it, format. Yeah, it doesn't see, think it would would work very well for a real life tournament either, but for UBs for sure. No, 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 it's a definite UB <laughs> format. Um, so that that's what's currently going on in the UK, which is a cool event. Um, another sort of list altering format that I've that has been seen quite a lot in the UK over the past couple of years is if there's an army swap round, um, which has its pros and cons in terms of people touching your models, which yeah. I think some people absolutely hate. So I'm aware that's a discussion. I'm aware some people won't play in an army swap event. But the UK Masters for the last few years has always had an army swap round. Um, 
which makes you know you're going to fight your list at some point and so you therefore have to maybe build deficiencies in or <laughs> or, or yeah. exploit where you've got to build a list that isn't just point and click you've got to build a list that you have to use well to use yeah um, and the uk masters that's one round i have been to an event in the past which it's probably my favorite ever event um it was a 10 round event and it was only 1200 points back in old eighth edition money um and it was you got matched up with someone you've swapped armies you played a game you then swapped back and played the game again and then took the average result oh <laughs> so in five army cup rounds and five usage rounds uh both always against the same person so yeah, it was a cool event. In that it it, it, it sounds like a very scientific event. Event like you, you <laughs> really making sure you have the correct data for each matchup. <laughs> Dan Thomas would have loved it. Um, yeah. But it, it was a really cool event. In that you sort of had to think about what you were taking. If you just took a, a really brutal list, then you had to play it five times. So um, yeah, it was a, that was a cool event. But both of those come under army swap, and I think army swap can can influence how people build lists. Yeah. Um, and it's like I said, it's one of those contentious uh, alterations where some people right, just don't want to do that, and I guess that's fine. Yeah, um... I, I, I'm not sure I would be so keen on it. Um, so but then I, I won't go to that that event. There are others. So yeah, exactly. And there, there normally is if there's an army swap masters, there's normally one or two people who are a little bit worried. But it is, I guess, a social contract thing that yeah, if you sign up to play an army swap. And you know, I'm not a big painter. I, I don't have massive pride in my models. Also, if I'm swapped with, say, Tim Tim Bocconnect in the UK, he's got an amazing Beastheads army. Unless I'm using his army and the Cyclops dies in a really stupid way, I'm not going to launch it across the room. Or, <laughs> you know, I'm going to carefully place it back on his tray because I don't want it. Like, I yeah. don't want it to be damaged at all because his army looks stunning. So, yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I'm sure that for the most part, it's. It's fine because people will be very, 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 very careful with other people's miniatures. But it's it's sort of uh, I, I've thought thought about it in in this way. Like I generally don't let people carry my models when I'm at tournaments and stuff like that. And it's not because I think they are more likely to drop them. They are probably less likely to drop them. But if something happens, then it's just yeah. such an awkward situation. I'd much rather drop them myself and some somebody else do it because. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and it like it yeah. inevitably does happen in army swap um like the old model does get broken yeah um but as long as you know I, it is a tricky situation when it's happened in the past but normally it's resolved pretty amicably ami amicably yeah really because people are like quite understanding that it wasn't intentional damage yeah um, but it is definitely an event where you know you've got to be okay with that happening one round to sign up for it otherwise yeah yeah, it can be quite tricky. And I, I do think there's ways around it. Like, if you say to the TO, I really don't want someone using my army, then, you know, they might. Uh, uh, in... I, I know one, one TO uh, particularly who, who would, in in that case, volunteer his own uh, own armies because he has every army. And then, yeah. and then he would just okay. Then you, you'd, uh, in that round, they, the, your opponent will use my exact, the exact same setup, but my models. And so with that. Yeah, and I, I, I think I know, that's uh, possible for some people. Yeah, there are some some TOs definitely that have that option. Yeah. Um, another like uh, variation uh, that I thought thought about doing is uh, just like a global variation on on the um, the ca category limits. So like maybe increase the core by uh, five percent units, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, yeah, I call it that. It's again like I I want big blocks to fight, uh, so making more core more prevalent is something that I I'd want to do. And usually when I build armies, I end up with like all right, this is the core that I, that I want, and it's like 500 points too much for the the limit, and I just feel stupid. <laughs> so, um, but I I think that again something that some people will not like at all. Yeah, I I think it. I mean, it's quite an interesting. I, some armies definitely have better core, and I think it could be quite interesting if you say for all the different fun categories that are out there, 
you can increase any of these categories by as much as you want. You also have to increase your minimum core by that much. Ooh, so if that's you a want, good idea. Say, if you want, so I'm trying to think of one I know off the top of my head. I, 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 th I think uh, one one thing I would do with that is probably do a Vampire Covenant and extra core, extra characters. Like go hard yeah. in on the characters. That seems like something that, that I would do. Yeah, so like, if for example, Chain Beasts in Beast Herds, I don't know the percentage off my head, let's say it's 30%, but you wanted 50%, then you've got to add 20% to your core. So you've now got 45% core and 50% Chain Beasts, but... And 5% and, character, and that's your and, army. <laughs> and a single Khan running around on his own. But, um, yeah. Like, it, it gives you that option to... I, and obviously, I haven't looked at how that would change builds and whether that would break any fundamentals, but you'd see some really cool stuff, I think, and, and people thinking outside of the box, which I think is always positive. Yeah, for sure. On that vein, we didn't mention it when talking about uh, point sizes, but going to Grand Army, where you double the, the limitations for a lot of options, uh, is also something that you, you can do. Yeah, uh, I, I've promised uh, one of my, my my friends that I will host a, tour, a grand ornament, uh, a grand army tournament, so that he can use uh, uh, as many monstrous rats as he as he wants again, uh, because they were limited recently. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I I guess one thing we've not spoken about that is is pretty different, um, is whether a tournament is a knockout or a Swiss format. Yeah, that's true. Again, something um, that UB unlocks. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, knockout events for me are, are pretty interesting. Um, I know I've harped on about Malifaux quite a lot, but the old Malifaux Masters used to be day one, you got put in groups of four, and you had a round robin, top two go through. On the Sunday, there was a one day event that anyone could play in from either the Masters or anyone else. So those people still had something to do, so they hadn't wasted their weekend. Yeah. You then had quarterfinal, semi final, final. If you got knocked out in the quarterfinal, you could drop into the tournament from round two onwards. Um, obviously, it wasn't ideal. And it, the knockout is a totally different feel and a totally different ethos to to a Swiss format. And I know uh, Fred ran it with the WTC a few years ago when the teams were in groups of four. They went into a knockout stage and every team had games organized until the very end. Some chose not to play. But even if you got knocked out, you were still playing for a certain place. And I, yep. knockout games are fascinating. I think. They have been used a bit more in on UB over the last year and a half, which is good. Um, but I also think it's just a really interesting format. Like you know, you're trying to get out of a group and then win loss draw, and I think lists for win loss draw are very different to lists for twenty nil. Yeah, um, that's very true. Um, so yeah, it's just it, Swiss format does work to an extent. A lot of Swiss format is luck of the draw. I think to win a knockout format, like by the time you get to the final, you're probably going to be in a very hard matchup anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, that person's also got through five or six games, or how many games you put in place. So, um, I, I think it removes some of the luck of the draw. Obviously, you can get knocked out early by a bad draw, but you'd still have to get to the final. So, yeah, I think it's an interesting format. I agree, it works slightly better on UB, or if there is a one-day event running on the day after. Yeah, um, there are ways to mitigate it in a in a real event, but it's... yeah. It's something. Every time it's been discussed for being a real life event in the UK, I think there's been a lot of pushback saying, "Well, what if I get knocked out early?" Yeah, um, which I sort of do get. But yeah. There are ways. There are ways around it. So, for sure. All right, I th sort of only have one, maybe two points left. Uh, do you have any more um, list building variations? Um, list building variations are. <laughs> The <laughs> what I thought of earlier, which I don't think is a good idea, goes back to when I used to play a lot of Lord of the Rings. And when you went to a Lord of the Rings event, you used to take a good and an evil list, and you alternated between using them. So you would play somebody's good list with your bad list, and vice versa. And then next round, you oh, play all right. <laughs> so you made um, sure that there, that there weren't any good versus good matchups. Huh? Yeah, exactly. And like, so you did need to bring two armies. But it'd be quite interesting if you split Ninth Age down the middle and you had an Order and a Chaos side. Yeah. And then... Which, uh, if you suggest that to a, to, to a Scottish knight, knight or something like that, it's going to be a big big no-no, I, I know for yeah, sure. I, 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 won't message, I won't message Ed over it. But I think it'd be interesting <laughs> to see, like, if you were told you had to bring one list from these eight armies and one list from these eight armies. Yeah. 
you know, what would you bring? Um, and then you know you're playing a certain set of eight. So let's say, for example, all the elves, all the humans, and all the chaos. Yeah. I don't know, are all on one side. Then you know that you're going to have to use one of those eight armies against one of the other, like orcs, skaven, sort of uh, vermin, yeah. vampires, undead. So you, it, I think it'd be quite interesting. I don't think it worked that well for Ninth. I think it worked really well for Lord of the Rings because of obvious fluff reasons. Yeah. Um, but it was just a, a format that I have played in the past and I hadn't really seen. Uh, um, I guess you could like do it in so, some sort of way to just avoid the mirror match at least. Like if you're yeah. being, if we're being two armies, then you can always make sure that no, you never do the mirror match. I do. I I think some mirror matches are super interesting though. Yeah. I, I see. I think mirror yeah, I, I, I know one tournament I went to, and this this was a bit odd before because they didn't didn't announce it beforehand, but they decided on the first day that the first first game will be mirror matches only. Uh, first matchups, everybody got a, got a mirror match if if it's pos- yeah. it was possible. There are certain art like I. Every time I played Sylvan Elf versus Sylvan Elf mirror match is not a good game. Basically, <laughs> Pathfinders get into range first. So yeah. Um, and then I've just reminded myself of one of the list format that I think the UK did during lockdown. It's been a long time. Is you submit three lists for an event. Um, obviously, it works better on UB than real life because that's a lot of models. Yeah. You submit three lists for an event. They can be the same list. They can be different races. You know, it can be whatever you want. Your opponent then vetoes one of your three lists, and then you pick from your remaining two. So it's quite similar to how Hordes and War Machine used to work when you used to take three masters to an event and veto one. So let's say I took a, each of the elves once, and I wrote a, a list for each of the elves. My opponent might veto the Dread Elves, and then I would have to pick between the High Elves and the Sylvan Elves for my game, yep. and I'd do the same to them. That sounds cool. But again, quite tricky for a real real-life event. But for UB, for sure. All right. Uh, the last bit I had about uh, list trickery is uh, um, opening up the uh, special special items more. Uh, the last uh, uh, tournament I went, I went to, the tag team tournament, um, the doubles, uh, in that game you could pick special items from your allies' book in addition to your own. Um, Interesting. Yeah, that was super super fun. I I, I ran uh, uh, Empire Sonstal with Worm Swarm items, so I had a uh, a Pyromancer Master with uh, mm-hmm. uh, Second Awakening, so you could reroll the number of hits for each each spell, <laughs> and that was nasty. Nice. <laughs> so there are a lot of combos that you can unlock with that. I I quite like that. Um... I, yeah, I, I haven't thought of any combos off the top of my head that would work. No, it, it's not, not something you think about. <laughs> like no, exactly. I, quite, I, I like it as a form. I, I do think mixing things like that up, do, like, it's just nice to have a variation. And, yeah. you, know, you, you hear about that pyro combo there and you're like, oh, that's horrific. But at the same time, yeah, everybody else uh, like, have combos. Uh, so. I think uh, it became a bit extra odd because my partner uh, had to cancel, so I was teamed up with another guy who also had a, his partner cancelled. Uh, so we had both of us had a list with special items from an, uh, an army that wasn't present. So we had four army books between us. So he had a sh- shapeshifter lord with uh, sliver of the blazing dawn. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was pretty cool as well. Yeah, I, I yeah, it'd be cool to see that. It'd be cool to see what combos people could come up with. I, I wonder though how you would you would make it in a uh, not tag uh, like doubles tournament. Maybe just make it that um, so you, you you pick one list and then you pick an, an extra that you can also pick items from something like that instead of like yeah. allowing you to pick free freedom of range. Like and this reminds me, you can also do like mercenary or detachment type uh, deals where you uh, have bits of an, another army in your 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 army yeah i know i mean while you're talking i don't know what you said to remind me of this but i i don't know if you saw the recent draft event that was part of the wtc that fred was running where uh, don't think so he, he asked for people to submit lists to him in advance he then picked i think it was 20 lists that were all quite different and quite varied not your standard go-to list for each race. And then there was a draft to see which list you picked from that pack of 20. 
um, I don't know exactly how it worked, but basically there was the 20 list, you're in a group of four, player A picks a list, player B picks a list, so on. Then yeah, you... this, this does sound familiar, yeah. I think I heard something about it. And then uh... you can only use each list once, and then it's gone, and you had to sort of <laughs> you had to ration your list through the event. Yeah. You were trying to pick lists that suited you, and it was quite interesting. I didn't, I didn't see too much of it. So, yeah, but that's certainly another way to vary it. All right. The last bit that I had on my list uh, is um, like narrative events. It, I, I think it. it, it Calling them tournaments is probably not the best idea because it, it it's not really suited for that. But I, I know it's something that's fairly common in Age of Sigmar, and I wonder if something similar could be made for uh, the Ninth Age, where like you have a TO who has like a, an overarching story that he pulls forward and and matches people up a bit depending on that, and the results in, influences the story and feedbacks and and like all of that. And you want players who who also like engage and and, and write the story as it goes along. I think I, I I always love the idea behind narrative events, and we've we half seen a couple in the UK where, when you showed up to an event, you drew a random counter out of a bag, and you you were assigned to that team, and sort of each team was trying to win. But at the same time, I think if you gave a lot of tournament gamers a choice between a narrative event or a just an event, I like, yeah, I think a lot of the competitive yeah, it, it's a di- very different crowd, and you sort of had to build up a new a new crowd for it there will be some overlap of course but like you, you you probably get a lot of different players and you have to like build up a new scene for it i guess yeah i i do really like narrative events it's just and obviously I... if people are, have got limited time and they have to choose their events like for me i personally would probably choose a competitive event over a narrative event based on not being free every weekend so yeah i, I it's tricky in that they look great on paper and I'm sure they are. Really, I've been to a few. I've not been to loads, but I've been to a few. And um, it'd be cool to go to a few more. It'd be cool to see what what people could do with free raid on the ninth stage universe as well. Yeah, I think though, like like as we said with um, with Lord of the Rings and good and good versus evil, I think that the open world of uh, geopolitical co- com- conflict of the ninth age setting isn't super suited for it. Like you, you sort of want this more good versus evil type of deal. I, I think Age of Sigmar does it well, with the, where they have like the overarching grand alliances. Yeah, order chaos destruction, things. Yeah. Um, it, it gets more natural to like build a store around that instead of sixteen different factions that all all do their own, own thing. So I think you'd have have to like sort them into some categories, it's kind of like they did with the Avras campaign uh, that they ran on on the forum for a while. Where they had like pro status quo, contra status quo, and like maybe so, yeah, the third one was just random um, stuff, pretty much. Uh, and it's it, it was sort of allied, but more like just a common goal um, in, in the story. So I think you, you'd need to do something like that to to, to get the story working, basically. I I think the other slight issue of a narrative campaign, and this is maybe me being overly harsh, is that the fluff behind Ninth Age doesn't grip me as much as the fluff that was behind the old world. I, I, I've got a lot of books behind me over there, all yeah. about the old world, and I'm currently reading the Blood Bowl Omnibus. And, um, you know, the old world for me is, as as for a lot of people that probably played Warhammer, is quite nostalgic. You know it quite well, especially with anyone that's played Total War will, will have got to know it even better. And so you can set these campaigns in very specific regions, and you sort of know almost already what's going to go on, and you you know how each faction is going to play in. Yeah, I, I guess my response to that is: if we do narrative campaigns, people will engage more with the Night Age setting. True. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's point. like it's a feedback loop in that, I guess. Yeah. True. So, but at the moment, it it would be quite difficult, uh, I, I guess. But. Um... And like I, I have no idea where to start doing this, but I, if someone were to an, o, o, try and ho, o, organize something like this, I would probably want to go if it's close to me at least. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I don't know where I would start if I were to try and host this. So mm-hmm. there's that. All right. Do you ha- had? Uh, did, did you have any more points that you want to bring up? 
I, I think I've gone through them all. I, I mean, yeah, we've been rambling on for a good while now, uh, two hours. <laughs> I, I was trying to think of any other formats, and you know, even the obscure ones from other game systems have sort of been mentioned. But I think, I, I mean, if somebody made a list, there's probably what twenty to thirty different things we've mentioned, and it just shows that you know, if, if you are a TA, there is a lot of options that you can branch into outside of just four five hundred standard map pack standard missions. Yeah. And um, I do think the people that play Ninth Age are open minded enough to try anything. Um Yeah. And I I, I think like the um, the pandemic has opened up some people to it as well, with you be do, being so different and allowing for some different experimentation. Yeah. Um I, it's just quite like there's some of the formats we were talking about and I was quite excited that one day I might get to try those and you know even this current beta event, like I, I, I rambled about it on on Slamrat months ago, and I, like it's sort of a bit of a, like I pushed it for the UK Masters. There was a vote from the top thirty players in the UK on the format of the UK Masters. I, I'm pretty sure Vito came bottom, and then suddenly it's turned into an actual <laughs> event. I'm like, wicked! Like <laughs> it, it is nice to do different things, and especially yeah. it, when real life events come back and you, st- you know, UB will still exist, whether people use it as much it remains to be seen. It'd be interesting to see what real life events turn into and and so on. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Are we just going to be- go back to the standard four thousand five hundred points games, or are people going to experiment more? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see some more experimentation. I yeah. think it'd be really cool. Um, I do think people would would go for it. So it'd be interesting yep, to see. Sure. All right. Um, well, then uh, let's uh, wrap this up. How have you been going on with your uh, assembly? You made any, any progress? Everything is done other than the arms on eight cav and 12 warriors. Nice. And I haven't put the arms on because I don't know what weapon was on that one. <laughs> um, I was going to just start gluing the ones that I liked on, and then I was like, I need to check what my current Saurus Cav and Saurus Warriors have <laughs> because I probably want to go with the other option, um, yeah. whatever that is. So I've about a minute ago I paused because I'd I'd got to the arm stage and I was like, okay, I'm going to pause. But yeah, not too shabby. Yeah, that sounds good. I made some progress on the um, Necromancer. Or... Uh, nice. Turning out quite pink. Um, it's been fun, but um, not that much further on. But I, I'll probably finish finish this guy this weekend. So that's nice. Nice. Look forward to seeing it. All right. Um, then uh, to an, everyone listening, I'd love to hear what you've been working on. If you worked on a, a, anything during this show, uh, and I will thank you, Craig, for coming on. It's been great having you. I think we had a wonderful discussion here. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, thank you to everyone who's who's uh, in, in the audience, who's been listening. Um, thank you very much. And we'll see you on the next one. Cheers. <laughs>